Hello, thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Boudoir Guild. I am stoked to have a good friend of mine here with me today. We are, we're going to get real about what it takes to start a business, pandemic or not. Emily just happened to get real unlucky when she started hers, uh, but it totally worked out. Also, I just have to say, Emily here is an anomaly because in the photography world, we always recommend that our clients do not get spray tans because there's like streaking and splotching and they get the spray tan stuff on their clothes and on our clothes in the studio. And it's just generally a disaster. And I've been working with Emily for over a year now. And it's been amazing like to actually have someone that I can trust my clients to go to because it's not really about being tan because we can edit that, but it's how they feel when they have the tan and that ups the, the level of magic that we take in the shoot. So I'm stoked that I can actually offer that to my clients and I'm excited to share Emily with you here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for that intro. That was awesome. <laughs> of course. Who are you? What do you do? Yeah, uh, my name is Emily Scott. I own a five room tanning salon out here in Campbell, but came from humble beginnings. I did start the business about 10 days before COVID started. And in California, we were closed for a minute or two after, you know, once the pandemic kind of took over, right? So then I just kind of had to kind of pivot a little bit and get, you know, a little bit more like transition more online and transitioning into online sales and doing, you know, self tanner and then like my own line of retail, which was really fun. But since we have been able to be open after those, I mean, I think it was like 18 months or so, um, business has been really solid. I mean, um, I transitioned, I had a home studio for a minute. Then I um, moved into a salon suite for about six or eight months. And then um, we built out a five room tanning salon. I have two employees um, that work for me right now and we're only getting busier month over month. So I couldn't be more grateful for that. So exciting. We work with a ton of businesses too, which I, at the time when I had started the business, I was thinking more so like, what do I need to do to obtain more clients? And I've realized that, I mean, even before I had the bigger space, um, you know, connecting and networking with other business owners um, is really where the magic happens. You and I got coffee very early on and, you know, you're, you're so business focused and business savvy and you've tried so many things that I've really been able to take a lot of that and kind of remaster it and put it into my business, which has only helped me grow. So thank you. And like, you know, also working with so many businesses, that's really an opportunity to almost trade clientele kind of just goes to show that people really buy from people. And I have my own database of clients. You have your own database of clients. The people watching this have their own database of clients. So really getting that one-on-one, -on -one, you know, FaceTime with another business owner really does kind of unlock those opportunities um, to get in front of more people. Totally. And there's a lot to unpack there. We, I'm sure we could already fill the episode with just the handful of things that you've just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And the last thing you just said about having one-on-one -on -one time with other entrepreneurs, like this is such a big thing because being a business owner, working from home, usually it gets lonely. And when your friends aren't entrepreneurs or business owners, they don't understand what it is that we go through, how personally we take our business and everything that happens in it. And unless you have a circle of people around you, and it can be remotely also, like thankfully we're in the same town here, but I have friends around the country that I can call as well. Just those days where you need to talk to somebody and your spouse doesn't get it. Your parents don't get it. If you have kids, uh, I don't think I do. Your neighbors, your <laughs> friends, like they just, they don't get it. And, and having somebody else who's been there uh, is absolutely invaluable. So if nothing else from this video, go make friends with business owners, but don't leave yet because mm -hmm. we have so much more goodness coming. Let's, let's go back to what you were first saying, uh, not to stroke my ego, but the, the bit of inspo you mentioned about trying things over and over again. You'd never launched a spray tan company before, right? This is like your first go into all this? Yeah, this is my first go. When I um, I did about six or seven years in corporate advertising where I primarily worked in startups. I did a stint where I was at DWA, which is a B2B agency, and I worked with some major brands. But I would say that I was more on the startup side or like medium business side. So I was really like boots on the ground, which is what helped me learn so much 
that I was able to implement into my business. I am super techie, weirdly techie for a spray tanner. All the automations and all the ad buying that I do and all the, like my business runs basically off of one mega Excel sheet, you know? So I know I'm kind of an anomaly in that way, but implementing new things is really hard when you have a new thing that now is supposed to pay your mortgage. <laughs> and you have no idea if it's going to work, but you can't just like half-ass no. it. You got to go in and be like, cool, Full I got to go all ass. in on this thing. Yeah. <laughs> and we have no idea at what point, I mean, you can set like a kill time, right? We're like, I'm going to give this 90 days. And if I'm not seeing X metric, then, then we kill it and we move on to something else. But that's one thing that most business owners, and I know photographers especially are terrified of doing. They're like, what if I spend all this time on Instagram or TikTok or a Facebook group or whatever, and then nobody books? Like, how do you handle that emotionally? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I didn't really give myself another option. So it was like, <laughs> this is going to work because it has to work. I feel like everybody reaches kind of that breaking point and everybody's breaking point is different when you are doing something that you don't necessarily love or enjoy or that you don't get a ton of fulfillment on anymore. And then you see an opportunity. And even if it's just like a sliver of a difference better, you're like, I have to figure out how to make this work. So, and that's kind of what happened with spray tanning. I mean, I did have a passion for spray tanning. I mean, I had a passion for beauty, but I um, was really looking for something different. And then I didn't really give myself another option. Like consistency is everything in business. And that's what I've seen from working in ad campaigns with a ton of brands. Like the biggest mistake that I would see that other brands made are they would take a look at an ad campaign after a week, right? And it doesn't matter if you're spending $2 a day, it doesn't matter if you're spending $200 a day. A week is not enough for any algorithm. It, everything is built off of code now and code just makes an algorithm. It's like its own language for a business to talk to or to put ads in front of a person. It's just all code and code cannot locate any sort of pattern after a week. So I kind of took that to heart and I was like, this is not going to take off in a week. This is not gonna take off in, in a month. I need to start to compile tasks and responsibilities that are going to drive the bottom line without ever um, derailing customer service. So I just started to stack all these things and I did it. I was consistent, maybe not every single day, but for a really, really long time, probably six or eight months during the hardest period for any business owner because I wasn't even able to see anybody in person or take clients. Yeah. So consistency is the answer. And to just, life. <laughs> right. But having that mindset in the beginning, like you said, you didn't give yourself an opportunity to have a plan B, uh, essentially. Well, your, your plan A was to have as many plans as it took to make success For happen. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So now that you've got your, your retail space, which looks great and it's constantly growing and changing, you didn't mm -hmm. like have everything totally figured out from day one. And there was so much up in the air. Like, how did you know when you were ready to make that change? I never had goals to own a salon. I never really had goals to have employees. I realized over these last six months that I'm actually not really even a planner. And I thought I was my whole life. So that's been really introspective and interesting to like learn about. But it more so came to only having two options. So when I was in a salon suite, for example, I had 90 square feet to work with. You weren't able to see our brand name anywhere, which means you couldn't really tell what we did. You couldn't look us up. And because we didn't have any of that frontage, everybody or any of that signage, everyone found us online. So I was ready to expand and start to do more advertising so that people would be able to drive by and see us or people would, you know, see us in the newspaper or something and be like, oh, wait, I've seen that sign before. And I just wasn't getting that type of exposure. Our location was hard to find. The parking lot was really dark at night, which was a big deal for clients that are coming after six o'clock in the winter out here. So and we're open till nine o'clock at night, you know, so we want everyone to feel comfortable. And so it more so just came to like a decision. I after six months, I was no longer on a six month lease where I was held in. I was moved over to month to month. And I was was growing pretty rapidly and the reviews kept coming in and we got so many great referrals that I was like, I don't really want to operate 
and bring on, I wasn't able to bring on a second person in the salon suite because I was the only one legally allowed to have keys, which I respected. So I was like, okay, I have a decision to make. I can either halt my growth right here. And maybe if my scenario was a little different, maybe I would have, but it made sense being, I don't have kids. I have a husband who also has like a local business as well. So we're not going anywhere. And to have that dual income, just in case anything didn't work out, you know, was also a safety net that I was very privileged to have. And now it ultimately just came down to a decision. Do I want to expand in a location or because I've be I had basically exhausted that salon suite. And you know, the way that the micro economy had gone here in the Bay, the commercial rent was never going to be cheaper than it was at the time. There were so many spaces who had unfortunately gone out of business, which posed an opportunity for me. So my cost per square foot would have gotten a little bit more expensive had I waited. So all those were factors that went into the decision to ultimately build and grow the space and grow employees and for product lines and services. And that's just it. You went at each phase when you were ready to, when when the previous action, whatever it may have been, could not take you to the next step. When there was an opportunity, then it was like, I have two options and I can either stay or I can keep going and keep growing. The the build and for the business was one of the hardest things I think I've ever done in my whole life. I had no idea what I was really doing, but um, you just got to be resourceful. And I'm I'm in the same boat right now. You know, I operate out of my home studio and I'm doing, mm -hmm. you know, multiple six figures in revenue, but I, I can't bring on second photographer to shoot full time in my studio space here because, well, it's my home. And that sort of defeats the purpose of me having employees doing the work for me or, or doubling the workload because then there's just people in my home and it's gonna be really hard for me to sit on the couch and read a book or something, not that I ever relax during the day. In theory, it'd be difficult for me to have any sort of downtime in my home with other things going on. And again, I don't have kids. I don't have anybody else living here because I'm just paying for the whole house so I can do this. And it is, it's terrifying to sign the lease on a place knowing that, cool, I've got to pay for my home, and now I have to go pay for this retail space, and it's like a lot of money that I have to bring in every month to do it. But a working, thousand percent. Yeah, yeah, right, but working on the plans of like hiring a photographer and figure out, cool, can I get someone to shoot outdoors for a while? Let's build up the client base, and let's do this. And photographers yeah. at home, you're probably thinking, well, I am trying to get my first clients. I am nowhere near that point, but, but it just goes to show like you don't need a big fancy studio to get started. You don't need really anything more than whatever space is absolutely necessary to get the ball rolling. And then you're going to learn things that you don't even know existed now. And that's going to totally change the way you make your plans. So it's kind of funny that you said you thought you were a planner until you realized you're not. I feel like I plan a lot of things and it's like, well, I didn't know a goddamn thing back then. So how, why would I even <laughs> consider making plans that far out? It's more of just yeah. like, yeah, it'd be sweet if one day this happened. And that's about as close to planning as I'm going to get now. Well, and to your point about the photographers who are in their early days, just trying to figure out should I jump into a studio space? Should I just do more outdoor shoots so I don't need to leverage like any sort of like monthly commitment, yearly commitment for some of these leases? I'm sure you're asking yourselves like chicken before the egg. Do I need to get clients first before I get the studio? Do I need to get the studio and that'll attract clients? That's such a, it's it's so tough. What What would you tell somebody who had that concern. I know what I did and what I would do differently if I could do it all over again. So when I started, Perfect. I rented a studio from somebody for a little bit. I thought once I have a studio space and I set up basically the same setup I'm kind of have right now in my reveal room, like this TV stand and most of my furniture, everything I bought for that studio space back in like 2013, 14, somewhere around there. None of my clients cared. I didn't make any more money or they didn't think I was any cooler than what happened before that. And I was doing outdoor shoots, but I'm like, now I'll have a fancy studio with tons of expensive equipment. And so I spent all that money and locked myself into that year lease and it made zero difference for my business. None of my clients cared. So as long as you have a space where you can shoot, and I know we're talking boudoirs, so you can rent an Airbnb, you can rent a hotel room. I did that for like three years after I got rid of that studio space 
because I, don't know, I could hop from different hotel rooms to hotel rooms and have different themes and different styles of decor. Busy months, I could totally book out. And if I wanted to take a month off, I didn't have to pay for it. So I had that flexible financial burden also. And then you just need a place to do your reveals, which you can rent that kind of meeting space. We work is out of business, but in some sort of co-working space, you could find any sort of retail space to sublet, kind of like what, what you did with your your first location for Bronze Palms, you know, anywhere where you can just meet privately and show clients photos, maybe you have some samples on the wall. That's all you need. It doesn't have to be a big fancy studio. Why do you think so many people want the big fancy studio? Is it like an ego thing? Totally. I mean, I have a lot of lighting equipment now because I've taught a lot of workshops and classes where I've needed multiple stations set up. 98% of my photo shoots, I still use one light. <laughs> I used the same 50 millimeter lens for years before I bought anything else, thinking oh, I'll buy all these you know, other expensive lenses and nail all my perfect shots. And I developed my style and I really just use like a 35 now because my room is only so wide, but a 35 and a 50 is really all I ever shoot with. So two lenses, one light. I mean, sometimes it's fun to play, but I don't, I don't need that stuff and I can rent it when I do need it. I'm a big fan of renting things until you know that you absolutely need them and can justify the expense. Agreed. Don't just buy something because you think it's going to be the next new fad. If you're not into the trend, it's just going to sit. Selling it is hard. We only know the numbers inside of our own business. So you may see another photographer and think, well, they've got this big space. They're totally crushing it. They're making so much money. They've got all this stuff going on. And they might be drowning on the verge of bankruptcy. Maybe they've had to downsize their home because they signed a lease they can't afford. Maybe they bought all that gear and I don't know, somebody tripped and knocked over a light stand, took out three of their pro photo B1s and they don't have the money to repair any of it. So there's a ton of gear in there that doesn't actually work. Like we don't know what's happening in anyone else's business, but our own. And so many people have no idea what's happening inside their own business because they ignore all the numbers. So comparing yourself to somebody else is a losing battle every single time. And you teach spray tanners how to build businesses just like I do for... Photographers, I'm sure you see people leaning on the hood of a Ferrari acting like they have the coolest salon in town and then they get arrested for touching somebody else's Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, there are definitely some revenue numbers out there that I'm not going to say are inflated, but that's why it's also extremely hard to talk revenue because we don't know what anybody's expenses are. I mean, and I do a fair amount of coaching among like the spray tan, all the spray tanners across the country. And, you know, we're all trying to do the best we can, but then to see some of the humble brags that go out, it's confusing. And I think it can be really confusing to first time business owners because you're that ultimately then becomes your goal. But then once you get there, you're like, wait, this sucks. <laughs> That's what happened to me. I There were a lot of women within the space at the time that were talking about how they made $100,000. Oh, to make six figures. And I was like, it's on. That's going to happen for me. Photography, spray tanning, um, the product prices are a little bit different. Um, and so are the, and the margins are as well, right? So a spray tan, our spray tans at the time were $60. So you're working with a $60 product that can incur every 30 minutes based on like demand and popularity. Um, and then also like local competition. Whereas I know your prices are, you know, one time investments that happen maybe once a year or once every six months for your more popular clients. Um, and they're in the thousands, right? But they yeah. also take one full day to shoot and then, you know, they have the reveal, they come in and then you have to um, continue with your sales pitch. So the prices are a little bit, they vary among what we do, but um, yeah, the principle is still the same. It, it could feel really daunting as a, a budding business owner. Did you experience that as well when you got started? I still experience that. Do you? Okay. Yeah. I mean, what are they doing? How did they do that? Right? Yeah. I see people yeah. online and I look at their work and I think, well, I don't see anything special about it. That doesn't mean it's bad. It's just to me, I could not imagine not posing my clients, not using flash, like not, I don't know, like such a low production. 
which for a huge percentage of clients, that's exactly what they want. So they're serving that need. But I don't know the health of their business. I don't know if they're actually enjoying it or making money or if any of the people that they're showing photos of actually paid them for any of those photos. They could have just been friends or free giveaways or, you know, $39 Groupon sessions. I have no idea. So when I find myself getting into that point or into that place, you know, like we talked about earlier, having entrepreneur friends, you can call and be like, hey, uh, am I being crazy right now? Or do I need to be a better photographer? Do I need to charge more? What am I doing wrong? Another thing too is I think there's a lot of confidence in education. So whenever I find myself being like, how could that be possible? Like there was a local person in town who started offering spray tans at like $42 a tan. And I was like, I don't know how that could be possible. And that just meant that like, I need to look back at my numbers and figure out where my holes were because I know my numbers and anybody who is going to charge at $42 for a similar service obviously does not. So I think it's really important. And then, then I felt more confident because I'm like, I have this location, we have two tanners on every single day, um, we're doing really well. And I know that there are certain memberships or discounts and promos that we just cannot offer because that it just wouldn't make sense for the business. We right. compete with the biggest tanning salon. Um, they have a chain out here. Those That was really who our biggest competitor was or is they've got six or seven locations out here and I'm constantly getting their marketing about $30 unlimited spray tan booth. And that's cool. They must have some sort of upsell that happens um, in the salon, I hope, so that they can start to get a little bit higher or lower their customer customer acquisition, get people coming in more. But knowing your numbers, I think is really where we can kind of step back and be like, oh, that's going to hurt at the end of the month for yeah. them because giving away, you're basically almost a charity, you're not really profiting anything for your business, you're just hardly making your credit card payments. That can be so scary. I mean, we all for many of us who have been in corporate careers, we so badly want to step back from traditional nine to fives to have more time freedom and have more autonomy over our finances. And by undercutting local businesses, other businesses with kind of like your niche neighbors, not your competitors, your niche neighbors, and not really knowing your numbers, it's it can be really dangerous. And I think it only happens for maybe about six months before. I mean, we've all been there before where we look at it and we're like, oh, actually, that promo doesn't actually work for my business. So going into into your finances is super important for that. And that is the end of part one. Part two is going to really dive into marketing. We talk about client acquisition, ways to generate more referrals, and just how to start making more money in your business. We talk pricing as well. Uh, so be sure to get on that. 